A lot of people go through Jump Cut, which teaches people how to make YouTube videos or be successful on YouTube. They go through Jump Cut, not watching YouTube videos at all and thinking, hey, if PewDiePie can do this and make millions of dollars per year, I sure as hell can do this because this guy's not talented. He's just talking to a camera. But people don't understand how difficult it is to mm -hmm. actually break through the noise and put in the hard work. When you don't have a channel yet, coming up with an idea that works and gets views is mm -hmm. really difficult because one, you have to understand what good content is. This episode is brought to you by Momento NFT. Momento NFT is a direct-to-fan social NFT app that allows fans to own viral moments from their favorite creators and unlock perks like meet and greets, autograph merchandise, and more. As a creator, you can easily create valuable images and video NFTs of your best social content. And as a fan, you can own viral moments from your favorite creators and unlock perks like meet and greets. Momento NFT is backed by Animoca brand Denza and Mark Pink. Check out the app available on App Store and Google Play. You have a really interesting career that you kind of like read a book. You grew up in the Bay Area and then as an immigrant, you always have like the entrepreneurial mentality as like, you know, you would sell like CDs and then have the just hustle mindset. And like, I really respect that. To start with the show, would you want to share a little bit more about like how you grew up and how, the, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I think the most important thing is that, uh, at least to me, the mo kind of the mo most formative aspect of my life was that I grew up poor. My family was in Section 8 housing. It was government funded. In high school, I went to like the line where where you get the, the cheap lunches that were like 30 cents. And so I've always had this desire to break out of that and do something bigger, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it really hurt me when I saw kids around me getting like Nintendos and Playstations and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would be, I, I told this in one of my YouTube videos, but one year my mom gave me a bag of candy because that was a particularly mm -hmm. bad year for my parents just financially. And I got a bag of candy for Christmas. And so at some point I said, look, I don't want to like live like this. And it's not just about the material things. It's like, I don't care about the newest toy, but I want experiences, right? I want mm -hmm. to be able to go see a movie because I want to be a movie maker. I want to be able to afford a computer because I want to try to program something. And so ever since I was in, I think, fifth or sixth grade, I started like doing weird businesses that would make me money so I can afford my own stuff. I was like, I'm going to help out my parents this way. So I think my first like really successful quote unquote business was selling bootleg CDs, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. My friend had a CD burner at the time. For those that don't know, you used to not have an iPhone or an iPod or whatever. Like you have to put a CD into a CD player and you go buy those CDs for like 20 bucks. But my friend had this thing called a burner where you copy CDs over to another blank CD for like the CDs like 50 cents. And so you can make as many copies as possible and you can download like the, the album and all this stuff. And so I sold those CDs and, you know, made like a few hundred dollars off it. And ever since then, I was just kind of addicted to doing things myself, being my own boss, starting my own businesses. Yeah, totally. So when you first started, I guess like your drive came from like this kind of, you know, pursuing of like these like financial freedom in a way went on to be like a lot bigger than that. Like you achieved as like, you know, someone who have billion views on YouTube, you created multiple channel, you have a lot of people's channel grew, and then you went through YC, you're like pretty successful yourself. Since you mentioned that your parents were not we could quote unquote say like our billionaires in the world, like how did you find the ways for yourself? And then who is on your personal board of advisors when you were on this path? My advisors during the, I didn't really have advisors while I was on this path. Mm -hmm. I think this is, we're talking about during my younger years, right? Like high school mm -hmm. and college. I just had friends that kind of had the same mindset as, as me and said, Hey, I want to do this as well. Mm -hmm. So I would find people that were really interested in starting their own business, taking control of their own life financially. And we would just always talk about like business ideas and how to do stuff. And, mm -hmm. and eventually we would start things together. So in, in college, I started with my friends, like a t-shirt company. I sold books at some point. Mm -hmm. I found out a way to arbitrage like college textbooks. And so these things were just fun. And I think my quote unquote advisors at the time were just 
like-minded people who like doing that stuff mm -hmm. for whatever their reason was. It's probably different than mine, but people who like doing this stuff and we would just talk to each other about these things all day, every single day. And it was fun for us. I feel like a lot of your, the, the moves that you make, for example, you know, you, you guys went on to do like simple pickups and then like the game is like a best-selling book, right? I'm sure like a ton of people read it, but like, you know, not everybody who you know made a giant move to turn that into content to like trying to inspire like millions of people doing the same thing like in a s smaller scale like how do you kind of like figure out these kind of ways to just like go big and what's it like did you stumble upon these things just randomly or like is there something in your character that kind of like destinate for you to kind of like go for this really you know big wave or like big crazy route I think my my mindset on that has changed now, but in the past, it was really just like throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I wish I could say that I was really smart in how I like maneuvered these things and, mm -hmm. and planned these out. But honestly, I was just a, a college kid that was looking for a reason to drop out. And I dropped out three times, actually. Um, it wasn't until the third time that I was successful with the Simple Pickup YouTube channel and eventually doing mm -hmm. YouTube videos. And so, yeah, to answer your question, it's really just trying things that I fa find fun at the moment and then going with it. Totally. When you were thinking about like the things that you did, right? Like you mentioned that like, you know, you were not like a particularly the best student in the world, but like you're like a hustler, you're like really street smart. And how do you kind of like find your unfair advantage? And how do you kind of like translate that into your business? I think I'm really good at like dissecting stuff and, and backwards engineering things. And so, you know, I obviously try to do that with our first YouTube channel, kind of based on this book called The Game by Neil Strauss. Mm -hmm. And then I did that with Jump Cut, you know, teaching people how to create YouTube videos. So I'm, I, I don't know what it is in my brain, but one thing that I would say is my superpower is just kind of like looking at how things work and creating a framework, basically, mm -hmm. to, to see how I can replicate that success. Mm -hmm. well, you mentioned about like the framework, right? Is this like a numbers game? Like, for example, you watch like 10,000 videos and then you kind of like hardcore study them or like you kind of like just find patterns because of you've done it like so many times. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's 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 both. So you can't make like you can't be a good writer unless you read, mm -hmm. right? You can't be a great content creator unless you watch content. You can't be mm -hmm. a great filmmaker unless you watch movies. So part of it is, yeah, you have to be able to watch these things and be obsessed with it. If you're not, then you're just not going to be able to create those frameworks and be able to replicate that success. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, number two is also doing it. So you can watch it and, and say, oh, the, this movie is good for this reason. This movie is bad for this reason. But then once you go out and do it, you, you figure out how fucking hard it is to make a movie. And then, you mm -hmm. know, you say, okay, well, this was not as easy as I expected. You know, next time I'll do it better this way. Next time I'll do, do it better this way. And, and after a few of those, then hopefully you're, you're able to become at least a decent movie maker. And I think that just goes for pretty much anything that, that, that you try to be successful at. You know, a lot of people go through Jump Cut, which teaches people how to make YouTube videos or be successful on YouTube. They go through Jump Cut, not watching YouTube videos at all and thinking, hey, if PewDiePie can do this and make millions of dollars per year, I sure as hell can do this because this guy's not talented. He's just talking to a camera. But people don't understand how difficult it is to mm -hmm. actually break through the noise and put in the hard work. You know, to go back to your question, it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. If you're creating a YouTube channel today, how would you break your YouTube journey into like a couple different sectors? And then like, let's say like from zero to one and then to a thousand followers to maybe like a hundred K and then from a hundred K to like the millions, right? Like, I mean, let's say these are like the three kind of different stages that you have to go through. Like, what would you do in each stage to kind of like help yourself get there? I would say, okay, so from the zero to one is probably the mm -hmm. hardest part. When you don't have a channel yet, coming up with an idea that, that works and gets views is mm -hmm. really difficult because one, you have to understand what good content is, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand that. But number two is you have to like wait for the algorithm to then promote your content. And that just kind of, kind of comes with time and quantity. The way I would think about it is instead of trying to be really original to just kind of come up, like look at what's been. A lot of entrepreneurs, when they make video, when they make ads, or when they make content on YouTube, 
they get very informational. They want people to talk or they want to talk about their products, mm -hmm. right? Let's say I'm mm -hmm. selling this cup. You know, mm -hmm. they want to say, hey, this cup is so good because it keeps your drinks warm. It keeps like, mm -hmm. it keeps, you know, you it's dishwasher friendly. It has temperature control, like all the features. Nobody wants to know about the features, first of all, mm -hmm. when it comes to marketing. They want to know about the benefits to their life. Mm. right and so how is it going to benefit my life it's the emotional appeal so most entrepreneurs know this when it comes to marketing like on their landing page and stuff but mm -hmm. they don't apply that to the content that they create so they create content that's super informational that's super dry that's really boring to promote their product but really the way to think about it is teaching people how to make this perfectly beautiful cake but she went through a program and i said hey first off nobody cares about like the re actual recipe you can put that in the description if you want they can like they want to be entertained right like 99 percent of these people are not gonna actually make the cake probably probably 99.99 percent of these people are not gonna make the cake um so just take something from what other people are doing and apply it to to your niche there were a lot of people that, at that time taking like movies and pop culture items slash characters and making it into food so Rosanna Pancino was like a huge, huge accelerator in this realm. She was a gamer. So she would take a lot of like Minecraft characters and then put it into her cupcakes or mm -hmm. like take, I don't know, this she might have not done this, but like Mickey Mouse characters and put it into lollipops or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Lori from The Icing Artist just kind of took the same concept, but made it into cakes. So her most popular, one of her most popular videos is cakes that look like Disney princesses. I might be butchering that a little bit, but essentially, you know, she's using the same concept as somebody else, putting it into her niche, with, which is cakes, and then adding a little twist to it. So everybody thinks like, oh, you're just copying people. No, you're not. You're, you're taking the concept and turning it into your own. It is definitely like a really great way to think about things. And then I really like what you said about in a video, you mentioned that like, you know, on YouTube, all the videos are like, let's say 70% entertainment and then like, you know, 30% of like the actual step by steps. And then like when it comes to courses, there's like a flip, which is 80% like or like 70% of the, the information and then 30% entertainment. I feel like that was really interesting to think about. But I think one thing is, coming up with like great idea and then the most important things is like execution right i think many of us are like challenged by how are we actually shooting this video right like do we actually script everything out and then like you know making the jokes that's like you know insert it here or whatever or is it more like you know you just wing it let's say you, if you make like a thousand videos and like one of them is gonna hit what is a better way to approach it i think it depends on your skill set so if you are not good at kind of improving on camera uh, mm -hmm. then writing it out is absolutely the best way to go. I think for most people, that's probably the best way to go. That's the way I did it before. I would write mm -hmm. things out as much as possible and then either read off a teleprompter or have the script next to me and then read it and then like talk to the camera. So that's probably the best way to do it. But by all means, like if you're just a naturally funny person and you're reviewing food and you don't need to write that, then don't write it. I think like the other part is like about making it into like a visually appealing stuff you know the editing and the like the angle like the sound effect it's technically just like making a mini movie and then especially nowadays all the youtubers kind of have like raised the standard of the quality and production of like all these like youtube tutorial like to just literally anything like everything looks like a mini movie these days like what would you focus first on like you know i think we had the discussion about like you know probably having an entertaining content matters a lot more than like your video quality however you know a lot of these like expression can only be done because of you have like amazing editing team or like stuff like that like how would you kind of like break down this executional process let's say like if we're making like a cupcake video right like she has to pick the theme and then like she has to like clean up her kitchen her kitchen have to be looking like somewhat pleasant to look at and then she have to probably insert some jokes from the films and movies and then for me if I were running her channel like I would be like really concerned what if Disney sues me if I like make a really ugly princess or whatever right like so what are some things that like goes into the preparation of that video that people probably don't see in terms of preparation of the video let me take a step back. I think the most important part of the preparation is actually the idea itself, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, cleaning your kitchen and making sure the cake like looks nice, that's important. But if the idea itself isn't good in the first place, then all of that stuff is going to be moot. And so the process that most people don't see is actually the brainstorming process on coming up with 
the subject for your video. So I'll give you an example. Um, I, uh, Graham Stephan lives here in, in, in Vegas. So he's a big finance YouTuber. He has like millions of views or millions of subscribers. And uh, he told me for every video he makes on his main channel, mm -hmm. he does four to six hours of research on what the, the video is going to be. Mm -hmm. So four to six hours just to decide what the video is going to be about. Mm -hmm. And then an additional, you know, day or whatever it was to write out the video or, mm -hmm. or at least outline it. And so he takes a very, very long time thinking about what the next topic will be. And uh, I think that's pretty crazy in terms of like the, the length of time. But I would say a lot of people spend too little time on that. You don't need to spend four to six hours necessarily. Mm -hmm. But it should definitely be, you know, a, a substantial amount of time. I would say when we were doing simple pickup, we would spend for each episode probably an hour coming up with like, here, here are all the different ideas. What should mm -hmm. we do? Which one's the best? And then eventually picking one. Let's say like right now, a lot of people are making content because of content is kind of like a table stake for like a business, right? You help like the company Flex to make like their commercial. And then a lot of people are making content because of they want to be picture as like a thought leader or like doing like a marketing viral marketing video for like their products right like since like those are like the more of like a major drive for people to make content than versus like becoming an entertainer uh, which is like a very different concept right like let's say like Graham Stephan's video I would say I personally like I really respect him as an entertainer like I would take I would watch the YouTube video when like chilling in a park. So I think making a viral content and build trust are completely two different separate things. Like many of the creators out there, like, you know, although you can have some really hit viral success, does that really help your business, right? So how do you kind of like balance those kind of pieces since, you know, you're the person who also applied to YC, who got in and then who, you know, ran like a company and then basically you turn that into a successful like money making product. And how do you see being a content creator, how, do, how does that tie into your business nowadays? And then how do you not only like build trust, but also get certain views so your message can be out there? The, the content I create now is different than the con content I created before. <laughs> In the past two years, I've been doing a lot of ads for kind of like companies that spend a lot on advertising. So if you think about like Squatty Potty or Poopery, like those kinds <laughs> of ads. And so how that relates to my business now is, okay, well, I create these ads for people, right? And they pay us for the production and then obviously pay us for our time mm -hmm. as well. And so that is kind of like a system that feeds into itself. And the reason is because, okay, we make this ad for, let's say, Flex, right? It starts with, hey, my name's Kara and I love to f but I don't like my period. Mm -hmm. And then it leads into this whole thing about how Flex is an alternative period product that you can have sex on. And so people see that commercial, people convert. And when people convert, that means we can spend more money promoting the ad. So once you spent millions and millions of dollars, tons of people have seen the ad. And naturally, some portion of that audience is going for their own product or, or you know, they have a, their own company that they're, they're, they're working for. And then they, they email us because they find out who made the ad, those us, and they say, hey, we want to do something similar. And so that's kind of the flywheel that we created with our agency side of things. But I think maybe for the average creator that potentially is listening to this, the way to think about it first is almost like the opposite because people don't know how they're going to monetize yet. And I think the better way to do it is, hey, come up with great content first, get the views, and then you can try these different like businesses to to, to make money and monetize. And once mm -hmm. that works, then you can, kind of, can create a flywheel from there. But it starts with the content and actually getting eyeballs and people watching your stuff. When you're thinking about, let's say like a Shopify store or something, like how should they think about the content play? Okay, so, so instead of the content creator, what yeah. if they already have a business and they yeah. want to do content? Okay, this is actually super easy. A lot of entrepreneurs, when they make video, when they make ads or when they make content on YouTube, they get very informational. They want people to talk or they want to talk about their products, mm -hmm. right? Let's say I'm mm -hmm. selling this cup, you know, mm -hmm. they want to say, hey, this cup is so good because it keeps your drinks warm. It keeps like, mm -hmm. it keeps, you know, you it's dishwasher friendly. It has temperature control, like all the features. Nobody wants to know about the features, first of all, mm -hmm. when it comes to marketing, they want to know about the benefits to their life. 
Mm. Right. And so how is it going to benefit my life? It's the emotional appeal. So most entrepreneurs know this when it comes to marketing, like on their landing page and stuff, but Mm -hmm. they don't apply that to the content that they create. So they create content that's super informational, that's super dry, that's really boring to promote their product. But really the way to think about it is how can I make this entertaining so that people who don't even care about my products will watch this, like random people in the world will watch this. And it has some type of funnel into the product. So I'll give you a really good example of this. Have you seen that show, Will It Blend? So this was like years, years, years ago, but this blender called, I believe, Blendtec, they created a show called Will It Blend, where they use their blenders, yeah, to blend up like iPhones and like tablets and like, you know, the Mm -hmm. new iPhone 14, Will It Blend? And they actually blend it up. Eventually they turned into this thing where they kind of like CGI'd it. But Mm -hmm. at the beginning, they actually blended up really expensive tech products and they Mm -hmm. showed how strong their blenders are but you could see how that's 80 percent entertaining and the funnel here is hey the blender's so strong why don't you get it for your smoothies but that's i think the missing piece of what a lot of entrepreneurs overlook when they create content is mm-hmm. how do i make this entertaining mm-hmm. and use it as top of the funnel and eventually get people to buy my stuff from there totally i actually have another question piggyback on this right like some of our listeners are like maybe let's say like tech founders like they're selling like a 2b product although i mean I'm sure like, you know, even you're selling a 2B product, there's like a human who is doing the buying, right? But on the other hand, the other day I saw this like accounting agency and then they created like a full on TV show, like they're mocking, let's say like a famous TV show, let's call it, I don't know, like Game of Thrones or whatever. So basically they're like doing like a fake Game of Thrones for like their staff that are kind of relevant to accounting, but not really like, so I think they went pretty far. Like it, the show was like SEMA entertaining. I watched a couple like, you know, 10 minutes shows. It's not like bad, but like on the other hand, like, you know, I don't really know if I would like go there to like do my tax. How would you kind of like portray yourself as a to be business? Like, I mean, how would you do content on social media to get attention, but also like good attention? Basically they're selling to other businesses and you're saying, how can you make content that will get the like right leads? Like, how do you be like, I mean, I really agree with you on there. Like, you need to be entertaining. You need to like not be like, you know, hey, buy my stuff all the time. But like you're self-selling, you're like kind of like offering the entertaining value. But like on the other hand, people have to actually treat you seriously and like buying your stuff. How do you kind of make a interesting thing and then like also cover it into sell? And are you talking about like a video ad or are you talking about like YouTube content? Both. Like, I think in the end of the day, like you're for all the content creators, there's two sides, right? Like one side of people is like full time content creator. And then they're just trying to sell some product on the side so they can keep things going. On the other hand, there's like the business owners. They're trying to make it big so they can like, you know, monetize over their business or like personal brand. Like, I think those are two different goals. I, I think like making a really viral content is extremely interesting, but it doesn't necessarily going to convert into like, you know, purchases if you're like trying to like sell specific stuff that's not like super obvious to people it could it could so let me just be clear when i'm talking about this i'm talking about mostly like consumer companies Mm -hmm. if you're talking about like about SaaS b2b that's a completely different strategy and i think it's going to be hard to create content that Mm -hmm. that appeals to that business so let's just push Mm -hmm. that off to the side there's different ways to do that seo and and it's it's more informational that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about like if your customer is consumer mass market consumer this is the way to go if that's the case then it doesn't actually matter if the content appeals to them or not right the uh, appeals to the product so i'll give you a good example in terms of influencer marketing there's tons of people who say hey my content is this comedy sketch And then, by the way, this is brought to you by Audible, right? Mm -hmm. Or this is brought to you by like whatever, Dollar Shave Club. Mm -hmm. Um, Go check them out. Okay, back to the video. So that happens every single day on many, many channels, many, many videos. And the reason that it's so prevalent is because it actually works. These companies are paying influencers to promote their product, Mm -hmm. okay? So now imagine if the company owns that channel and actually hired people to come in and you know act on the video and now they have unlimited promotion to their to their product and in addition maybe they have a new revenue stream of like you know getting youtube views or anything like that that's run one really extreme example no company mm-hmm. would ever do that so you want something in the middle but just as, as a thought experiment imagine if that happens then they would have this huge channel that's 
you know, profitable, hopefully. And now they have unlimited resource in terms of promoting those fan, that fan base to their product. So again, mm -hmm. the ideal way is to kind of combine the two in some way, but that's like a really kind of outlandish idea that would still work in my opinion. How would you sell like a media product? Let's say if you're like, the New York Times or something, how would you position yourself on YouTube? I know Wired came up with like a lot of really interesting things. But like, you know, if you're just like a traditional media business, or like you, if you're like a tech crunch, what kind of content would you make to make people feel like, wow, like I want to like actually dive into whatever this platform is? So if I was tech crunch, what kind of YouTube content would I make so that people mm -hmm like visit my website, techcrunch.com. I would first look at what other media companies did do, right? Have you heard of Cut and Jubilee? So they do a lot of different kind of like social experiments, kind of buzzfeedy. So if you just look by most popular, they put flat earthers versus scientists, right? Mm -hmm. And then they kind of duke it out. Six white people versus one secret black person, they're all blindfolded. Can you spot it out? So these are kind of just games and conversation topics that happen on their channel. You could potentially do something like that, but in the tech space. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe you do angel investors versus VCs or, you know, small business founders versus startup founders. You could play a game of billionaire versus people who make 60K. Like, can you spot them out? Like you're basically essentially just taking other ideas that work and applying it to your niche, which is in their case tech. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I would do and make this really entertaining. And then they can say, hey, if you really like this tech thing, check out our website where we interviewed these founders mm -hmm. and you can do a deep dive on like how they became successful or something like that. Yeah, that's like actually really interesting. How do you come up with these things? How do you improve your soft skill? Because I feel like you always have these kind of like ideas that's like, you know, you're inspired by like, I don't know, like a 4 billion video you watch. I, I don't really know how do you kind of like educate yourself to be like socially smart. Was this from like, you know, you would say like a simple pickup era because of you have to, you know, chat with like 5 billion people to make a video or like, how do you kind of like improve these kind of creativeness or like street smart or whatever you're, you would identify as? I think you're referring to the like I, the content ideation specifically, right? Like pretty much everything, right? Like think about like, I was going to ask you about in YC, there's a question about like how you hacked into something, right? This is like, I assume like a legacy question. Why say ask all the founders that applied? How, like, you know, did you encounter that like question when you were applying? And like, you know, how would you answer or something like this? I just think like overall you have like hacked into a lot of things successfully. I wouldn't say hacked. Like I'm saying, I think you are really qualified, but like to stand out among like 500 other people, you definitely succeed at basically most things that you did, right? There's, I think there's two, two answers to this because th there's a second question now, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, so I think going back to the first one, it really just comes down to two things. One is studying the, the type of thing that you're trying to get better at, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's content, then watching a lot of YouTube. If you're trying to write a book, then reading a lot of books or short stories. So just studying what has worked before, thinking about why it works and kind of dissecting it in your mind. And then the second is what we talked about before, which is just actually doing it. You're just going to be your first few videos. Even if you have the best idea, your execution is just going to be shit sometimes. You know, I'm starting a new channel now. The first video I, I made, it, I was like, yep, this is terrible. And so I'm iterating on it. And it's going to take maybe three to five episodes, even as someone who has created as, as much content as me. It's going to take three to five episodes until I get good at creating that particular type of content. And so I think those are just the two things that you, you can apply that to pretty much anything in terms of, you know, the skills you're trying to get. How do you hack into things? Like what, what are something that you hacked into? It's kind of the same thing. So I'll give you an example and I'll tell you where I learned it. There were multiple times where we got onto the front page of Reddit and made our video mm -hmm. or some other big forum and made our video go viral, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were able to kind of quote unquote hack Reddit. Mm -hmm. And so the way I found out about how to hack Reddit is literally someone made like a huge post on how he yeah. hacked Reddit. And then I read that and I said, hey, I could apply that to my videos. He was doing it for something. I, I believe like a business he was promoting or something about that. But he made this whole post on like either the New York Times, the Guardian, something like that about how I hacked Reddit. And, you know, it was like a guest post and it was all just to promote like his book or something like that. I forgot what it was. But I said, hey, that's a really interesting idea. What if I use that and stole that idea and applied it to my videos so I can get my videos to the top, top page of r slash videos, r slash like mealtime videos, these, these kind of video subreddits. And so I took that idea. I did it a few times. And, you know, out of the 20 times we, we, we tried it, maybe like six or seven times it worked. 
and it got into the front page and we got hundreds of thousands to millions of views. So to answer your question, how do I hack things? I wish I could tell you that I was original and I come up with these ideas by myself, but it's just really doing what other people have done and then having foresight, I guess, not really foresight, but kind of to apply it to your particular use case. What's your content diet look like? And how do you kind of like spot these like really interesting things? I think like as a regular person, like if I saw that title and I'm just like, oh my God, this is fake. Or like, you know, this is like just like some BS, but like you would pick these things to read. And like, how do you kind of like structure yourself to think so differently from like a content diet perspective? It's most of my stuff is curated by friends and people I hang out with. I don't hang out with creators so much anymore, but when I was first making YouTube videos, like all of my friends were all creators. So we Mm -hmm. had like a group chat where we said, Hey, check this out, check out this thing. Have you tried this? And I know other successful creators do the same thing. Graham Stephan does the same thing. He shares, he has a group chat that he has not invited me to, um, (laughs) where he, you know, goes over these kind of like strategies with people where it's like, Hey, I've been trying this and this has worked. Has it worked for you? Why don't we try this next week? And they're half, they're like helping each other hack the system and figuring out the algorithm. And I think if you surround your people who are obsessed with that stuff, you just Mm -hmm. naturally find these kind of like new things to try. I find that if I just find people who are exactly in my niche and then doing exact same thing, like it does not, it does not work. I mean, I only once I did share some articles with people I know, but like people are like, oh, thanks. Or like, you know, I feel like it's really hard to take off the edge of like the competitiveness of every everyone. Maybe I mean like a really small sector with a lot of really smart people. But like, you know, I feel like people are a lot less likely to share stuff versus like if I were in like a YouTube group, like people are making, you know, really random content. Like, and then like we would want to help each other out that way. But like, on the other hand, those are not, the exact same thing that you would apply into your videos. I think both are good. You, you, I think you're looking at it from like, okay, there's when I join these groups, there's going to be all this thing that doesn't apply to me. But I wouldn't think about it like that. I would think about, okay, I'm just going to give value to the group. And all I need is one thing to apply to me per year even, right? Or per mm-hmm. two years for this group, to, for my participation in this group to be worth it. So sure, 99% of the things are not going to apply to you, or maybe they apply and you do it and it doesn't work. Like whatever the thing is, all you need is one thing to make it worth it. Yeah, totally. Define like worth it, right? Like, I mean, for your skill, let's say you are on top of Reddit for multiple times. I think that's like a really big win. But mm-hmm. like, what if you got, sure, like smaller success, let's say, my normal post is like 30 likes and now it's 50 likes. It's a great success. But on the other hand, like it's not like you don't want to add value, but it's more like how much time would you spend, right? Like I feel like, okay, so maybe we're like getting into too niche of like a question. So I definitely want to save some time to like ask you about the business side of things. In general, like can you share a little bit more about like how do you turn yourself from like a successful creator to a profitable business or some like lessons that you've learned throughout this journey? I've had the same co-founders since we started Jump Cut Mm -hmm. and uh, one of them left. But going from creator to business, I think the most important thing is just hiring people. So as a creator or maybe even as a small business owner, you know, you're like you're so used to doing things by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for you to imagine like, let's say you're editing, you're filming your own videos, you're editing your own videos. It's hard for you to imagine like no one can do this but me because I'm the one who made this successful. And therefore, I need to be the one who edits all my videos, for example. And that that's totally fine if you want to keep doing that your whole life. But if you want to grow into kind of like a really, really big company, you just have to hire people. Being able to spot talent and interview really, really successfully is probably the you're growing your business. This is assuming you already have some success and you're making money, mm-hmm. right? Up until that point, there's a variety of skills you need. But let's say you're making money, you're making $60,000 a year, maybe $100,000 a year, you're trying to get to a million or even 10 million. I think Mm -hmm. one of the most important, if not the most important skill that you're going to develop is being able to identify potential prospects, get them through an interview process where you can make a really, really good decision on if this person is a superstar or not. And then thirdly, like recruiting people to actually come to your company. Because if they're really, really good, chances Mm -hmm. are, they're getting other offers too, right? So now mm. you, you have to sell them on why should, why should you work here? So being able to do that is just so important. And that's something I learned probably a couple of years too late. I made a lot of hires at the beginning when we, we were growing that I think I hired too fast. And it was kind of sad for everybody. It was sad for us because they weren't performing. It was sad for them because they had just left a job at 
for example, a big company and, you know, took a mm -hmm. smaller salary to come work at a startup. And they're bringing that kind of energy home with them and being sad when they, you know, see their girlfriend or their family or whatever it is, or boyfriend. And so just avoiding all of that altogether is going to be make everyone feel a lot better. And then also is going to be so much better for your business. You mentioned two parts, right? Like one part is about like, when you guys have the business, you focus a lot on making money. And then instead of like focusing on building a product, right? Like at one point, there's two parts. Like, I mean, I don't really know how you can focus on making a lot of money when you spent like a 500k on a video course, although that's like, you know, with a really successful founder. But like, I'm just curious, like, how do you guys like spend time at the beginning? And then what do you identify? I mean, but on the other hand, like if I were running a business now, like I would totally think about like, you know, let's make money first. And then when you have money, you can hire better people. You can like make better product. What would you do differently if you are running this show again? Like, you know, running your company again? Yeah. So just to give people a little bit of context, we made most of our money on one course called Viral Academy, which teaches mm -hmm. people how to create successful YouTube channels. It did really well because a lot of people wanted, especially during the pandemic, like people wanted the freedom to not have to work at nine to five, right? They wanted mm -hmm. the freedom to control their own financial destiny. And so it was a really popular product. However, what we learned was that most people just are lazy <laughs> at the end of the day. So we so we sold, you know, tons of this course for $1,000. And you would think, okay, people are investing $1,000 into this. They're going to want to really commit. After about six months, I think we took a survey of people who had signed up six or more months ago. And we said, hey, we sent them a survey with a bunch of questions. One of the questions was, have you started your YouTube channel yet? Again, this is mm -hmm. people who have bought the thing six months or more prior mm -hmm. to the survey. And what we found was, I believe 85% of people did not even do one video yet on their YouTube channel. And so that was a really mind-blowing statistic for us. And I wish going back, I would have known that earlier and focused on that more because eventually we created this thing called a boot camp. You know, we have like really in-depth kind of in-person sessions. We give them motivation and kind of incentives to actually create YouTube videos. And it worked out really, really well. However, by that time in our business, the CPAs of our ads went so high and we weren't able to get LTV up because inherently people just said, hey, I'm not going to do this. I'm lazy. I'm going to give up. And they don't buy any more courses. And so, or maybe they're not lazy. Maybe we just did a bad job of motivating them, right? Like it could go both ways. My point is, if I were to go back in time, instead of thinking about, oh, we're making money, we're running ads and we're making tons of money, right? On, on this product, like that's the metric of success. I wish I would have gone back and said, hey, it's great that we're making money, but let's focus the entire company on this one metric, which is to get people to create, let's say, 30 videos. Because I think after 30 videos, you understand how YouTube works and you're on the way to becoming successful. But we never really identified that metric. And so we always focus on profit and said, as long as we're making money, this is good. The problem with that, as I mentioned, is, okay, CPAs go up. You know, we, we did really well for two years, but eventually CPAs went higher than what our LTV is and we can't run ads anymore. And now we've kind of plateaued and it's something that we can't grow in terms of LTV because we started it, started thinking about it too late. I guess like at that point, when you're starting a new company and then like, are you still selling courses or like selling courses like done, like in your kind of like career? Oh yeah, we're still selling courses. We're still making revenue from the courses, but we're not actively like running ads or anything like that. Yeah. So it's kind of just on autopilot on the side. Since you are like the, basically the inventor of the YouTube viral videos, one of the OG there, like what are three things that you would say, like, you know, makes a video viral? So the most important part is just the emotional appeal. Does it make people mm. feel something, right? And I think really, that is the most important thing that you have to think about. What are you trying to make the person or the viewer feel? And how, like, how intense does this make them feel that emotion? So the more intense it is, the more viral potential that it has. Once you have that, there are certain things that you can kind of throw into the video that we call traits of virality that you can use. Um, so this is things like talking about a taboo subject, right? Um, putting two things together that don't belong together. Like for example, flat earthers versus scientists, telling a story, doing things that an underdog story, for example. So mm -hmm. these are kind of like the viral triggers that you can put in there. But the umbrella to all of that thing is how do you make people feel an emotion intensely? 
you have went through you create like videos that are like getting half billion views what are something that like most people don't know that about making things viral and then like being a content creator that you feel like would like surprise a lot of people the bad thing is that it's very emotionally taxing in a lot of ways that you wouldn't originally think so for example you just get haters all the time and people will say something like you'll spend a lot of time on a new concept for example and then people will say oh i hate this go back to old stuff this sucks you're you know fuck you whatever whatever or they'll just like make fun of your appearance it's like oh this like i don't care for about that because you know i like to joke with my friends about that stuff but for some people it's really emotionally taxing to be called fat when you put out a camera or be called ugly or say, you know, your teeth are fucked up. And it's these people that like, you don't know them at all, but they come into your life and they make these statements and it just hurts sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And then another way, another reason is, okay, well, maybe you see success and then your views go down, you know, you, you're getting a million views per video and then it goes down to like 500 or 400 or 300 and you're still making a good living. But the emotional tax of that is now you think, oh, am I not as good as I was before? Am I doing something wrong? Do people just hate me? Like, am I on my, like you have these kind of doubts and it's hard because you're doing this most of the times by yourself. So you don't have anybody to talk to. You don't have anybody to be there to emotionally support you. And it just gets really, really tough. And these are just two out of like, Dozens of examples that being a content creator can be very emotionally taxing compared to working, let's say, a nine to five job where you get like some type of salary, right? So that's, I think, the bad part. Some people, a lot of people, fall into drugs for that for that reason. So there's a lot of, you know, I'm I'm gonna have a podcast out of, with my friend Aria where he talks about why he started doing drugs and getting hooked on alcohol and you know, benzos and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just it's it's a side of things that isn't really talked about, but there's a huge emotional drain of being a content creator. With that said, I would say the good side is that once you become good at creating content, it's a skill that you can use over and over and over for so many different things. So I started out making YouTube videos, right? I went into making online courses. Then I went on to making ads for different startups that have cool products that now spend you know millions of dollars per month on the ad that we made for them to sell their products. And so those light switches in your brain are the same. And once you get good at that skill, you can say, all right, well, I want to move on to my next content creation endeavor and do another channel. Or maybe I want to do a movie. Maybe I want to do ads, whatever it is. You're able to take that skill and just apply it to so many different things. And I think when you're able to do that professionally and creatively, it keeps you very motivated. It keeps you feeling fulfilled. It doesn't, you know, it makes it seem like, not makes it seem like, but it, it makes it so that you're not bored just doing one thing your whole life. That being said, like we're at the one last one minute fire round questions for you. So number one is like, what's your favorite book? Probably The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. A really good uh, management book. Who made the biggest impact in your career? Probably the Fine Brothers. So they created like Kids React and stuff. Mm. When we were first doing YouTube, they were like our mentors and we could ask them anything. You know, when you say talk about impact, they definitely, I think we, like we were, had already had success prior to them coming in, but they changed our trajectory like crazy because they just gave us so much good knowledge that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm surprised they didn't take money for it. <laughs> Wait, what, um, what were like, you know, one lessons that you've learned from them? It was a bunch of small things. Um, so it wasn't anything like super huge, but for example, we were, we had this idea of Actually, no, I shouldn't talk about that. <laughs> they, they, we, we were going to do something that was going to piss off the YouTube community. And they said, mm -hmm. hey, you, you guys are new. Don't get cocky. Like, you shouldn't do that. And so okay. we, 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 had, we said, you know what? Let's table this for three months. If we still feel good about it, let's do it. And in three months, we said, yep, I'm pretty glad we didn't do that because uh, everyone would have hated us. But another thing they, they told us was like how to negotiate with MCNs. Um, so back then there was like these companies that would sign you on. It's kind of like an agency. And then they would take a percentage of your ad revenue. They basically essentially helped us negotiate this contract where this company was paying us more than our ad revenue was paying us. And we were getting, you know, we were getting paid about $1 CPM or one fifty, dollars And this, they, they helped us negotiate this contract where this company had, like started paying us three or three fifty dollar CPM. So that was that was that was really fun. And that made us probably, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars extra. Do, are you still in touch with them? And then what happened to kids react? It was really fun to like watch them and then like 
I think it, they just disappeared. Well, they I think it's still on, but they, they had that whole thing where they did like React World, you know, and then people got mad at them, which I get. <laughs> but yeah, Kids React is still a thing. It's just not doing as... It was, it's not as big as it was in the past. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, but no, I, I mean, I say hi to them every time we see each other at events. You know, we give each other hugs. Um, I have a lot of love for them. And uh, I have nothing but, but good things to say about them. So I'm sure they're working on a bunch of different things in the background that we don't know about. But just knowing them and the, the work ethic they have, I know they're killing it. How do you meet them in the beginning? You know, it's funny. They actually emailed us because they were going to start their own MCN. And was they were like, hey why don't you join us? And then like, eventually we'll sign you onto our MCN. So they were just kind of like at that time saying, Hey, we'll just be your unofficial advisors for now. And then in the future, just promise that you'll sign with us. So they never actually ended up doing that. So we actually just got a bunch of free <laughs> advice just, <laughs> just because it was good timing. Yeah. How do you stay in touch with these other creators? I think that's something that I'm pretty bad at, but the, the way I do it now, and not just with creators, but like other entrepreneurs and important people I meet, I have a, a to-do list. It's called Todoist, and I have a project called People. And so every everyone I meet, I just put them in there, and I put a date on when I should reach out again. And then I just reach out over email or over text. If they're in the city, I get coffee with them, I get lunch. But at the very least, I just shoot them a text or shoot them an email saying, hey, you know, what's been up? You're doing good and checking in. Wow. I mean, like, don't you afraid of like people ask you for five favors or something? No, because the people that I meet are not, you can tell that they're cool. Once they start asking for favors, then I would just blacklist them and not talk to them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but l l let me rephrase. Asking for favors is okay. If they go overboard with them, with it, then, you know, then I can say, hey, I don't, this person seems kind of like leechy and weird and I'm just going to stop communicating with them. But that has rarely happened in the last like 10 years where I wanted, where I had made a conscious decision, hey, I want to reach out to this person. And they became someone who was like really weird or someone that I didn't like. It's probably only happened like five times in the last 10 years because I think once you get good at hiring people, you're able to read people really well and make an assessment when you meet them, you know, what they're about and are they cool? Would I want to have lunch with this person? Would I, would I want to have beers with this person? How do you be a really good, like, articulate person and storyteller? Like, I feel like everything you said over our podcast or, like, any other podcast are even the most boring story when you're, like, telling them. It's, like, really engaging. You kind of, like, create those. That, I always think that I'm quite boring. <laughs> no, I think you're pretty engaging. I feel like, you know, even, like, when you were mentioning about, like, retreat or something, and then it was, like, a touchy-feely retreat, and then, like, you know, you're, like, having that mini story arc in, like, a two-minute story, it's, like, pretty in impressive. I just feel like that's, like, a really good skill to, like, have. But it's, like, really hard to actually practice in real life, though. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of writing helps. I think I still have a lot of work to do in terms of like when I improv or when I do, you know, podcasts like these, but writing helps a lot. And then I always have a framework in my mind of like, start with a hook <laughs> mm -hmm. and then end with something memorable. And so the story in between is, you know, kind of just like beginning, middle and end. But that's kind of what I think about. What's the most important part? How do you hook them? And then at the end, it's like, give them a concluding sentence that that kind of wrap, wraps everything up. When I started creating content, I feel like at the beginning, I thought like being a content creator, you need to be really, really creative. And then like now, like after creating for like two years, I feel like the most important skill is like kind of like setting up a system for yourself than just oh, yeah, being sure. like go at it like every day, freestyle, blah, blah, blah. But like, you know, what is your structure like? I mean, how do you kind of set up the system for yourself? And how do you kind of like maintain this level of consistency throughout the years or, you know, like when you were at least like actively filming YouTube videos? I think the specifics of that depends on the type of video that you're creating or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. But for, for me, it's just doing something every single day and making sure that you do it every day. So Jerry Seinfeld said, he like, he's a stand-up yeah. comic. So he writes mm -hmm. jokes every single day, even mm -hmm. if it's bad. Right. So for me, it's always like right now it's I'm creating a new a new channel where I do have to do a lot of writing and um, I make sure that I'm writing every single day or at the very least working on that channel somehow. I mean, I'm only doing it on the side right now, but every single day I say, OK, I'm going to spend at least, you know, two hours per day on this particular thing. That's probably how I do most things when I when it's because it starts as a side thing. But it's very easy to say, hey, it's a side thing. So I'm just going to kind of forget about it and then mm -hmm. like let it go because I'm getting paid doing this other stuff. Right. But I think it's important to if, if it's important to you, then you should make sure that you work on it every single day, even if it's just for like 10, 15 minutes.